Hello again, and welcome to this week's edition of SCLC TV. I'm your host, Maynard Eaton, and of course, our president and CEO, Dr. Charles Steele Jr. Dr. Steele, another week, another major controversy. This time, voter suppression. The Atlanta Journal Constitution said his bold headline that, uh, again, is a complete meltdown. And people across the country are talking about how voting in Georgia was suppressed. Your thoughts, please. Well, we've been talking about this all along, Mr. Eden, in, in regards to Jim Crow. The Jim Crow laws of yesterday or here today. Uh, and many people, you know, people hear, but they don't listen. You know, we've been saying this for many years since uh, 2013 in regards to uh, the fact that we lost Section 4 and Section 5 of the 1965 Voter Rights Act. And that's, that's a good example of what took place on yesterday, even with the President of the United States of America giving all the power to the states. We have gone back 50 plus years, Mr. Eden, and a good example was what took place on yesterday. Do you, we not, suppression? I can't hear do, you you. do you think it's deliberate voter suppression or a conspiracy of some sort? Absolutely, racism is deliberate and taught and institutionalized. Um, you know, it's time out for being sugar-coated and afraid to tell the truth. Uh, we've been saying this for many of years. Uh, this is another uh, a fashion of form of racism where uh, it happened primarily in the African-American community, the black community. And uh, this is a disgrace and a, another form of modern day lynching where people are trying to prevent you from voting. We died and lost our lives for the right to vote. And this government, in terms of state rights, are still trying to castrate you and ostracize you from your given right of the Constitution. Dr. Right, Steele, for, for the benefit of our audience, could you explain what Section 4 and Section 5 would have precluded, would have done for us? How would prevent it yes, yesterday? Section 4, Section 5 basically give the federal government, you know, we used to say the federal government was our friend. I remember that so vividly. Uh, we used to say that the federal government was our friend and that relieved us from being oppressed and threatened by the by state government. Uh, had you had the federal government with Section 4 and Section 5 involved uh, with the 1965 Voter Rights Act, uh, the implementation of what took place on yesterday would not have happened uh, had the federal government been involved because of that act with Section 4 and Section 5. That's a preclearance. You don't make no changes, changes without having a preclearance for the federal government. You would have had a implementation of training with the federal government being involved with the uh, Section 4 and Section 5 uh, actual being a part of, of the act that it was in 1965. But it was good because they said, in terms of the U.S. Supreme Court, we don't need no protection of black folks and Negroes and, and poor folks no more because you you have proven that America has gotten uh, a step above racism. We don't have to bring about the protection anymore. And they did an okadoke on us, as the old folks used to say. The okadoke was to further engage you that by having a black president, you don't have to worry about the federal government or racism anymore. You didn't have no protection on yesterday from the federal government. They could not have made those changes without the approval of the federal government, and it would have been implemented with training for the folks that should have been trained, and the state government did not allow this because they are in control. In other words, back in the day, anything changes Georgia made would have had to have been pretty clear, correct? Absolutely. Back in the day, it was called uh, uh, Jim Crow. And it, it, it was another form of government that was not legalized in terms of being institutionalized within this system. It was the Southern uh, aspect, a good old boy uh, type of situation. Uh, in terms of the federal government cut a deal and took the federal troops out with, 
Rutherford B. Hayes. That's how all of this came about in terms of Jim Crowism that relieved us and removed the federal protection at that time uh, from, from the South. So we had to go and struggle for all of these years, 401 years we've been oppressed and 240 years with direct oppression and being slaves. Then another 150 years of Jim Crow. Jim Crow has raised his ugly head again. And it was a reality check on yesterday. I know many other, I know you're a national leader, an international leader, but many other civil rights groups in Atlanta, at least, in Georgia, are calling for the Secretary of State to be fired. Do you agree with that? And if so, what difference would that make anyway? I didn't hear your question, Ms. E. Many people are calling for the Secretary of State to be fired as a result of what well, happened yesterday. Okay, okay, I heard you, I heard you that time. Uh, he is a real example of leadership that's basically dealing with Jim Crowism. He should have known in terms of his position and leadership of his position that he should have had training. People were not trained. He should have identified who the poll workers were. You don't wait till the day of the election and then you're going to bring in the machines and bring about the implementation of training folks. Uh, no, I voted absentee ballot. My wife and my daughters went to vote uh, on the day of the actual election. They stayed in line three to four hours to cast their vote. And I voted an uh, absentee ballot. But my wife was telling me about, about, about the option where they stayed there an hour and a half before anyone even came and told them what was going on. This is an insult to not only African-Americans in the state of Georgia, but, but to this country that's supposed to be the land of the free, the brave, and an example and immaculate position of leadership of democracy. We fell down, and again, I don't know what it's going to take to shock the reality of the citizenry of all ethnicity and background in America that we have gone back 50 plus years in terms of section four and section five being gutted. You have no more rights in terms of your individuality as a citizen within this country. You have gone back to the oppression of Jim Crow. Moving on, uh, yesterday was also George Floyd's funeral. Um, some say he's uh, an ordinary man who changed the world. You saw it. What are your thoughts on what transpired there and what perhaps his uh, going home service may mean to how we move forward? Well, first of all, again, with Mr. Floyd, God bless not only his soul and his family, but bless the movement in terms of the fact that we did realize and get some attention that we have a problem. My only concerns is that, do we have to lose another life? Like Jimmy Lee Jackson. People don't even know the story about Jimmy Lee Jackson, who was killed for the right to vote in, in, in uh, 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 Perry County. And, and, and that brought about the Selma to Montgomery movement. But it was out of Berry County that Jimmy Lee Jackson actually uh, lost his life for the right to vote. You fast forward that 50 plus years and you talk about George Floyd. Why do we have to have another tragedy? Why do we have to have another death in order to get the attention of the citizenry of the public citizenry of the United States of America. First of all, we could have saved Mr. Floyd's life by understanding and institutionalized the death of Jimmy Lee Jackson out of Perry County, Alabama. We don't know our history. And I'm afraid in the next 20 years, even before the end, 15, 20 years, people would not tell the story. That's why the Jewish community is so elevated in terms of what they do in terms of their unity because they never let you forget about the Holocaust and the fact of their struggle. We are ashamed of our struggle. 
had we done our job with Jimmy Lee Jackson and we can reinvent that movement again by telling the story, we would save the life of George Floyd. Where do we go from here? Some say the ordinary man who has changed the world. Um, we now have calls for social justice and change in social and police departments. We now have peaceful protests. Were you encouraged by that this last week of peaceful protest? Well, we always had peaceful protests. Let me say this. The civil rights movement has always had folks a hijacking. The Molotov cocktail that took place in Memphis uh, when just prior to Dr. King's assassination in 1968. It was the invaders that was planted there by the FBI. Did you hear what I said, Mr. Heath? The FBI yeah, sure. worked with a black gang called the invader to bring about the violence that erupted when Dr. King was leading lead the march just prior to his assassination in Memphis. He committed to go back to Memphis to show that we could have a peaceful march. But there have always been people who tried to hijack the civil rights movement, and it's still going on today. They are hijacking, for obvious reasons, personal agendas. Were you encouraged? Were you surprised by the multi-ethnic and multi-gender uh, uh, comp composition of many of these protests across the country in small towns and big cities across the country and across the world. Did that encourage you? Were you surprised or saying, hey, something's happening here based on I'm what you guys encouraged? I'm always encouraged when people come together of all background of ethnicity and people of various uh, racial makeup. But we've always had fair-minded thinking folks of all ethnicity and background also working with us in the movement. You cannot do this without having diverse support in terms of what we do. It's going to take more than certain individuals or any particular race to get us to where we need to go. We've always had people of ethnicity of various backgrounds, and we always had support of people internationally. That's why when I travel abroad, and that's why I do travel abroad, because people in various countries like France, uh, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, even Moscow, Russia, Berlin, Rio de Janeiro, uh, you're talking about China, Taipei, Taiwan, wherever you go throughout the world, they are saying African-Americans, don't forget about Israel. We have an office in Bethlehem and one in Demona, Israel. When they say we are the chosen one, African-Americans, the civil rights movement, of today and yesterday and yesteryear. They said that we are the chosen ones. We have a gift in terms of SCLC was given by God as a vehicle to freedom and prosperity. People try to not to include the actuality of SCLC in the historicity of what we have done in the movement because every day somebody trying to hijack your history. We will never give up our history. We will never leave this planet called Earth. When I'm gone, there'll be others. When they are gone, there'll be others. The historicity of the modern day civil rights movement that came out of Montgomery, Alabama, and ultimately all over the world will never be forgotten, even though there are folks with personal agendas to hijack and to eliminate the authenticity of what we represent. I hear you saying then, uh, we've had a glorious history, but that history will continue as this protest movement move forward as well. SCL still still in the game, right? Always will be. You can't protest forever, uh, Mr. Eaton. You know, the, 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 the ultimate goal of being an individual, of, of, of being a physical being on this planet called Earth will give you the insight and a vision that will let you know you got to have a strategy and a plan. What has hurt us in terms of African-Americans and people of all ethnicity who promote justice and equality for all God's children is the lack of collaboration. We don't collaborate very well. There's always been those skinning and grinning and want to be in front and be in front of the TV, but with no substance or history. People got to trust you. We're not here just by Ox Moser waving a magic wand. 
Something is sustaining us to be here. It takes a lot to be here. It takes a lot of money to run a movement. It takes a lot of money to run SCLC. It takes a lot of resources and it takes a lot of trust for those who are in position to provide resources to be uh, enabling you to sustain yourself financially, physically, spiritually from God and to continue the upward mobility of what we do. We are a international organization. People all over the world understand that and they applaud that and they salute that. Finally, Dr. Steele, this has been a tumultuous uh, several weeks or a couple of months. We've had COVID-19, we've had George Floyd, we've had massive protests. Now we have voter suppression. Any final thoughts today on what we've been going through? Well, nothing is new, Mr. Eaton. Uh, it should not have taken the death of, of Mr. George Floyd uh, for us to realize racism is alive and well. And let me ask you a question. How many times have uh -huh. you heard me say that it was a government that strategized to eliminate Dr. King? How many times have you heard me say that Section 4 and Section 5 has carried us back? I've been saying it ever since 2013 carried us yes, back, sir. but there are certain elements within our society who refuse to hear the truth. And they will keep people like me away from telling the truth. How many times you heard me say it's, it's institutionalized and it's embedded. America was founded upon racism. But there are folks who without the courage and without the anticipation of, of, of knowing that you're out of your comfort zone and something desperately seriously, injurily can happen to you and the ultimate sacrifice could take place by elimination of you who are afraid to tell the truth. How many times have we said it? And it often, shouldn't take a day. Very often, very it often. It shouldn't take a day of George Floyd or any other person for, for folks to realize that institutionalized racism is destroying us, that we have the banking system that refused to give loans to black folks. 90% of the payroll uh, uh, production, PPP, payroll protection plan, that 90% of African-Americans did not get any money. When we had the housing crisis, black folks didn't get any money. African-Americans didn't get any money. Poor folks didn't get any money. The money went to Wall Street and back to the banks. This government could loan us the money during this oppression of economics within our system, the recession of uh, depression that we are going through at this particular time, they sh can keep us afloat, but they don't want to help poor folks and they don't want to help folks of color. They could loan us the money and they will get the money back, which will stimulate the society. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that. You know the reason they won't do it? Because of racism and the bitterness within their heart not to do the right thing for those who are less fortunate than others. And the church said, amen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to our president, our CEO, a man who's not afraid to speak truth to power. Dr. Steele, thank you again. See you next week. You've been listening to SCLC TV. Thank you.